Good evening. Welcome to this month's uh, Western region of Young Rail Professionals webinar, this time talking all about the modern world of overhead electrification. Uh, if you don't know about Young Rail Professionals, we are an organisation uh, devoted to uh, helping people progress their careers throughout the rail industry and promote it as a wonderful place to work. I am delighted to welcome Gary Keenor along, uh, Group Electrification Engineer for Atkins, who is well versed in <laughs> well versed in the uh, world of overhead electrifications, having worked on such projects as the Great Western Mainline Electrification Scheme, and has even written an online book all about overhead electrification. And without any further delay, I would like to hand over to Gary. Thanks, Wilson. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, if you can't, then please shout now. Uh, otherwise, I'll just keep rattling on. Um, so yeah, um, as, as Wilson has said, my name is Gary Keno. I, I work for Atkins as group engineer. I'm, I'm uh, nominally based in the Swindon office, although like most, like many of you, I'm, I'm working from home for a while. Um, I within Atkins, I look after. Uh, major projects and, and smaller projects as well. Uh, I also act as um, Atkins Technical Authority for uh, overhead line, uh, looking after standards and, and quality and best practice and all that good stuff. Um, right, so let's get the slides working. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to talk to you a bit today about where we are at the moment with electrification. Um, the two agendas that are kind of colliding at the moment, one is the cost reduction agenda and the other is the decarbonisation agenda. I'm going to talk a bit about what Atkins is doing in that space, uh, what are, what are um, the, the, the digital work that uh, the digital work that we're doing uh, and the successes that we've had already and the work that we're doing based on that to, uh, to extend those successes. So let's talk about a bit about where we are at the moment in electrification. It's no secret, I'm sure most of you will be aware that the recent history of electrification has been a, a turbulent one. Um, at the start of CP5, the government tasked the industry with undertaking an, an unprecedented rate of new electrification. Uh, with hindsight, and this isn't a secret, I'm not saying anything out of, out of talking out of turn here, um, that wasn't the greatest plan that we've ever had. Uh, and in hindsight, we probably should have uh, said no or said, well, maybe we need to go a bit slower, um, but we didn't. And that led to some high profile failures, Great Western being the most well-known one, but there were a couple of others. It is worth noting that within, despite those failures, um, two things have come out of CP5. One is that, and this is really key, a number of CP5 electrification schemes delivered really well, delivered on budget delivered on program and uh, sorry uh, even Gary I don't think your slides are up oh really okay just before we get any further there we go there we go thank you Wilson <laughs> <laughs> it's all okay. right um, I'm glad you did that now before the slides don't actually matter too much at the moment they're just pretty pictures of people building overhead lines so um, so yeah it, but even those schemes that that delivered late and went over budget and over program, um, they are now making a big difference. Um, Wilson works for GWR, so he'll, he'll know that firsthand. You know, that these new electric railways are um, more efficient, they're cleaner, they have more capacity, uh, which will become an issue again at, one, at some point. They're not at the moment, but it will do. And they are better railways than they were. I saw, in fact, I saw some statistics. There was a report uh, issued last week that stated that um, the Great Western trains, the, the Class 800s, when they're running on electric, they are 40% cheaper to run than when they're running in diesel mode, 40%. Um, so those schemes have been a success. That doesn't mean that we get away with having delivered them um, hopelessly late and over budget, but they are now an operational success. So what have we done about that? Well, since 2016, the industry 
and electrification has taken a long hard look at itself to understand what went wrong. We do understand exactly what went wrong in great detail and how we can fix it. Fixes are well understood. The mainly, they mainly revolve around having a clear scope, having clear planning, taking the time to plan the project before you execute the project, having the right level of resources and having the right organisation around you. The slide's still good? Slides are all still good, Gary. Fantastic. <laughs> now, all of these all of these findings, all of this learning is really well captured in a, a report which RIA published uh, in 2019, the RIA Electrification Cost Challenge. Um, if you're not aware of this report, I would recommend going and, and having a look. Uh, I've provided the link here. It's not a long report um, and, it, and it sets out what went wrong uh, and what, but also within CP5, which schemes uh, did things well and, uh, and how we've learned from those schemes. And what it shows is that recent, the recent well-run schemes have been delivered within a one to 1.5 million pound per single track kilometer range. That's our standard kind of unit of cost measurement um, for electrification. So it shows that the projects have delivered in that range and that, um, that future schemes can also deliver within that range. However, that isn't in, that clearly isn't going to be enough on its own to give uh, to give government sufficient confidence to uh, to buy back into electrification. We recognise that we can, we need to do more, and that there, there is more. Network Rail and, and the supply chain, including Atkins, has recognised that further savings are both necessary, but also possible, um, and there are things that we can do. So Network Rail has now got a portfolio of projects that. It's working on to uh, around the area of reducing unit costs on electrification, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And a lot of that work is about challenging the old assumptions about how we do things. So that's the cost reduction agenda, but what about the decarbonisation agenda? Well, in 2018, government challenged the industry to remove all diesel only trains from the network by 2050 which I'm sure to some, most of you young people will sound like it's an awfully long way away, but uh, believe me, uh, 30 years isn't that long in the railway industry when, when most rolling stock has a, a lifespan of 30 years and uh, overhead line systems have a lifespan of 80 years. So Network Rail has taken that net zero challenge on and it developed uh, the uh, Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy, which isn't a very snappy title, so everyone shortens it to TDNS. So the TDNS is a is a strategy that was issued uh, last summer, and it is a it, I don't think it's under an underestimate to call it a landmark document because what it does is it analyzes all the available options for decarbonising UK rail, uh, and it concludes that for any route with either significant traffic or significant speed, electrification is the only route to decarbonisation. It looks at battery options, it looks at hydrogen options, and it concludes that hydrogen will play a small part and battery will play an even smaller part. But for the, the majority of the network, electrification is the only viable option. And crucially for freight, which is a big, you know, freight decarbonisation of, of freight, and I don't mean just rail freight, I mean UK freight, is a huge issue. If you look at the number of HGVs uh, trundling down your local motorway, um, there is no current roadmap for decarbonising HGVs on roads. Um, hydrogen isn't going to do it. Batteries aren't going to do it. So we need to put more freight on rail, and we need to make that freight electric freight. And for those electric, uh, for those for freight, electrification is also the only decarbonisation option. So this report, which again I I really thoroughly recommend, even if you only read the executive summary, it's well worth it. Um, recommends no less than 13,000 kilometres of new electrification. So for reference, at the moment, about 15,000 STKs of the UK network is electrified. So that's about 46.5%. Uh, this plan recommends that we go from 46.5% to 88% over the next 30 years. So that's a huge programme. It's, it's the largest recommendation for electrification that's ever been laid in the UK. So clearly that's an enormous uh, challenge uh, and 
unlike CP5, which one of the mistakes of CP5 was to treat electrification as a series of discrete programs of uh, pro projects rather than treating as it, as it needs to be treated, which is as a rolling program of work. Um, so by doing, by treating it as a rolling program of work, you need to get rid of things like competing for scarce resources and, and that sort of thing. So TDNS needs to be approached as a rolling program. We need to ramp up to a steady rate of production, and then we need to stay there until we're finished, rather than having the, the, the classic boom bust cycle, which is something that's bedeviled uh, electrification in the UK over the last 50 years. The great thing though, is that the cost reduction agenda and the decarbonisation agenda go hand in hand. They, they, you know, they, they absolutely support each other. Um, one of the things that reduces the cost of electrification is doing more of it. The, the, like, like anything, the more of it that you buy, the cheaper it becomes. Um, so uh, by doing more of it, we reduce the cost. But by looking at the technology and the, and, and the rules of the game, we can also make unit rate reductions, which will then support uh, decarbonisation and improve the business case for electrification. Before I go into what I'm going to talk about, about the work that we're doing within Atkins, I do need to do a slight digression just to talk about how, if you're not an overhead line designer, you won't necessarily appreciate how overhead line design works. Um, it's very different to if you're, for instance, a bridge designer, where you will tend to approach each design on its merits as a, as a kind of unique piece of work. Um, the traditional processes of design for OLE along a newly electrified route are driven by the volume that we have to deliver. So for if you take a 100 kilometers of two track railway, that's about three and a half thousand support structures. So clearly designing every structure as though it was a unique and, 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 and beautiful uh, item is not the right approach. You have to, you need to standardize your design, standardize the outputs, standardize the construction to maximize your, 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 your efficiency and your, your rate of production. So within the OLE world, we, we very much standardize our design based around a standard set of design outputs. So we have the layout plan and the cross sections and the, the person who produces those is, is known as the allocation designer. And, and these outputs form the backbone of what goes to site to be built. So these designs are developed using a set of, of rules and a set of parts. So broadly speaking, we have two existing uh, design elements that we then deploy along a railway. So the first is the system design, which is broadly speaking is the rules, is the rules that we have to meet uh, for the design to work. And you'll see here on the screen, this is the standard, this is the current UK rule set, it's known as UK Master Series, uh, and here what you see is uh, extracts from the system description manual, which gives you your basic rules of the game, you know, what, how far apart can your structures be, what are the tensions in the system, what's the basic geometry requirements, it sets out the basic rules. So that's the first half is the system design. The second half is the basic design, which is essentially the catalogue, the Meccano set that we have to work with. So we have the rules and the parts. And the allocate, job of the allocation designer is to take the rules and the parts and then apply them along a railway while plotting a path through all of the different conflicts and constraints that that railway has. Uh, so it's still a skilled job. It's a, I don't want, I'm not, if there are any allocation designers on the call, I'm not doing the job down at all. It is a complicated role, but crucially, you're, what you're not doing is designing from first principles for every structure. That would be it would take years to, to finish any OLE design if we were doing it from first principles. So it allows us to design efficiently and rapidly. But as with everything in engineering, there's a downside to that approach. Um, the, the rules, particularly the rules related to dynamic uh, performance of the system are like a safe space. Um, they guarantee that the system will work, um, will work well. Um, the rules have been drawn up to apply in all scenarios. So they, they, are, they apply equally on a fairly boring open route piece of railway as they do it into a really difficult tunnel, for instance. Um, and because they apply to all scenarios, including all the edge cases, it's, it's axiomatic that those rules must be conservative in some situations. And to make matters worse, a lot of the rules were encoded during the expansion of electrification after World War II. So most of the rules that we're working with today were in place 
by the 1970s. So these are rules which were generated using, you know, the tools that we had at the time. We're talking log tables, mechanical calculators. You know, this is pre, most of these rules were encoded before the computer age. Um, so, and these rules are in, in place forever since, and they have not been revisited during that period. But Network Rail now owns around 80 subvariants of overhead line, and those subvariants range from um, systems that were built immediately after World War II, um, which are basically are a pre-war design, right through to uh, modern systems, which are um, high tension, TSI compliant with multiple pans at high speeds. So the rules that were necessary for those post-war systems cannot be right necessarily for the modern um, OLE variants that we have. So the cost reduction agenda and the decarbonisation agenda have collided and given the industry led by Network Rail but with, with companies like Atkins supporting real impetus now to revisit a lot of the ways that we do things and to come up with better ways, more efficient ways of delivering electrification at a lower cost. Now Atkins is, this is this is the sales bit for Atkins, um, but it's a genuine sales bit, I feel. I think we're, I think it's a, a reasonable thing to say that we are in a unique position at the moment in terms of helping to meet this challenge. Unlike some of our, most of our competitors, we have a small team of, of, of engineers within the Atkins who are able, who are able to anal assess and design overhead line from first principles. Um, we, we have overhead line engineers who can look at it from first principles, but also we have, it's not just overhead line engineers, we've got mechanical specialists, we can call them mathematicians, we've got digital analysts, and we've got software developers in-house as well. And what, what that team does, I call that team the first principles team, because what they do is they'll, they'll just tackle a challenge um, starting at the start. Um, you wouldn't deploy them everywhere. We wouldn't deploy them. You know, they're not allocation designers. If you want 100 kilometers of route, we've got teams of allocation designers who will do that. But what the first principles team can do is tackle the problems that the allocation designers can't solve. Uh, we also have a, a, a supply chain partner who I must mention because they're a really important part of what we offer. Um, T-Riz are a company that we work with. Um, uh, they're run by a, an individual who used to work for us, who now has his own company, and we work with them. And what, what T-Riz bring is um, real hardcore specialist mathematical simulation skills uh, and mathematical simulation tools, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But crucially, all of the work that we do on the first principles side of life is all guided by people like me and some of my colleagues who who will bring it back to the real world, who really understand how overhead line works from a practical point of view. Um, it's quite easy. Some of the specialists we see in, the, in this arena uh, will kind of go off and do very academic based work and come up with recommendations that aren't practical to achieve in the real world. So. What we do at Atkins is make sure that anything that we recommend is actually practically uh, achievable. So let's talk a little bit about the first success that we had in this space, um, which is at Steventon on the Great Western Main Line. So if you are an electrification engineer, you'll know that um, we have a range of wire heights. Uh, we have to go over level crossings with high wires and we have to go through bridges with low wires. And we have to, we have a maximum right rate of rise and fall that we're allowed to have in between. And to give you an idea what that looks like, the current rule in the network rail standards is if you're traveling at 125 miles an hour, your maximum rate of rise or fall of the contact wire is one in 625. So if you want to drop by a meter, you need 625 meters of overhead line to do that, to do that in. So Steventon really crystallized the problem of what to do when you can't meet the, all those rules. Steventon is a sleepy little village just to the west of Didcot. It's a lovely, lovely place. Um, some, very, um, some very nice houses there and some very well off people live there. And uh, it's bisected by the railway and there's three ways of getting from one side of the village to the other. 
uh, you from running from east to west, we've got Steventon Bridge, we've got Stockside level crossing and then Causeway level crossing. Uh, Steventon Bridge is a grade two listed bridge. It was designed by Brunel's team and it enjoys uh, a certain level of heritage protection. The Stocks Lane level crossing is only 399 metres away from it. So when Network Rail was given authorization to electrify the Great Western Main Line, it very quickly identified that this was a problem, that the wire height at the bridge and the wire height at the level crossing were not compatible with the gradient that was needed in between. Um, it, essentially, the gradient at Steventon would have limited electric trains to doing 60 miles an hour rather than the 125 mile an hour that they should be doing at that point. And that would have added a one and a half minutes to the timetable between uh, Paddington and Cardiff and Paddington and Bristol. And this is a project that's supposed to be speeding trains up, not slowing them down. So Network Rail looked at all the options and I've heard if I had a pound for every person who said to me, why don't you just close the level crossing? All I can say is um, when lockdown is eased and you're able to travel, if you can make your way to Steventon, go and have a look for yourself and you'll very quickly realise why that's not ever going to be a viable option. Um, it's uh, There are houses right next to it. Building a bridge at that location would be um, not permissible. So after looking at all the options, Network Rail concluded that the only way to meet the rules was to uh, reconstruct the bridge. So it went and applied for permission to demolish the bridge and build a replacement. Now that met with stiff local opposition and eventually the application was rejected and the application has indeed now been withdrawn. Um, so while all this was going on, we were the designer of the OLE. We were doing the allocation design through Steventon. So Faced with the planning reject, rejection, we had no choice but to design the OLE with the bridge in situ. And in, eventually Network Rail had no choice but to build it with the, with the bridge in situ. So obviously the in situ OLE design couldn't comply with the, the 1 in 625 gradient rule. The, the shallowest we could have between those two fixed points was 1 in 202. So that's three times, that's three times the rate of rise and fall that the rules would suggest uh, would give good performance. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide now. So this this, gra this uh, diagram shows you graphically what that looks like. We have the two level crossings in the middle and then Stevenson Bridge on the right. So you can see what, rule, what compliant gradients look like on the far left and the far right. And then you can see how extremely non-compliant the gradient is between the bridge and the level crossing. I've also shown what a compliant gradient would look like and what that would have meant for the bridge. So you can see a reconstruction was the only option to provide a compliant gradient, Just given that the level crossing closure was absolutely never going to be acceptable. So what that meant is electric trains doing 60 miles an hour. Um, to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge, if we wanted to go 125 miles an hour, that would have meant the pantograph moving through its entire operating range in a period of eight seconds. Uh, if you're an overhead line engineer, it normally takes about 30 to 40 seconds for the pantograph to go through that operating range. So in 2018, electric trains began to run through this bridge, but GWR had no option but to switch back to diesel, uh, which had a particularly onerous impact on trains that westbound trains stopping at Didcot. So trains pulling away from Didcot, if those of you familiar with the Class 800 will know that it is no racehorse when it's on diesel. Um, so by the time they reached Steventon, where the line speed is 125 miles an hour, they were doing 60 to 70 miles an hour uh, because they weren't able to take advantage of the electric acceleration. So they were switching back to diesel, going through the bridge and then switching back to electric and putting the pan back up again, which is not, which we could accept while we're on diesel timings, but as soon as we went to um, electric timings, that wasn't going to be acceptable. So we've seen that the OLE rules are a safe space and we know, we, we already know that there are places where we can and indeed do break the gradient rules. Um, the problem is the, it requires computer simulation uh, to give evidence because no one's going to authorise an electric railway to open without evidence that it's going to perform safely. And until recently that that simulation process is very time consuming 
very expensive and actually for gradient scenarios not very accurate because of the way that, that the system was modeled um, only a few companies could provide uh, the, the, the the service and, and Atkins wasn't one of them but during 2016 and 17 we developed a new analysis tool which we called DRSS which stands for dynamic rail system simulation and this system which you can see a, a, a snapshot of it actually working here this isn't an animation this is actually a simulation um, it, it accurately models the real world conditions and the behavior of the panograph overhead line interface it's also much faster than traditional methods to give you an idea we can build a model run the model and give you an answer in about six weeks typically from a standing start and we have done that um, traditional models would have taken three months to do so so in 2018 network rail app came to us and said look we know you've got the system you've been publicizing it a bit can we use it to look at steventon because we've got to solve this problem so the idea of the work would be to give network rail sufficient confidence that we could run a high-speed test train without breaking anything and without running any risk of damage or, or or worse so we we undertook the simulation we simulated the two most onerous uh, bits of rolling stock were a two two five car class 800s coupled together with two pans up at 125 miles an hour and a 12 car class 3 at 70 mu with three pans up at 110 miles an hour so we did the modeling the modeling some of the results you see here um, giving the contact force readings that we were predicting we would see. What we said was 60 miles an hour, everything will be fine. 85 miles an hour will be on the margins of non-compliance and at 110 miles an hour we'll be seeing some non-compliance. But crucially, none of our non-compliant numbers were at the point where, we, where they were going to be risking any damage. So they were non-compliant, but still within the margins of, you know, we could run a test train and, and have these numbers and everything will be OK. So that gave Network Rail the confidence to plan some physical testing. And in early 2019, we, we ran a test train. Uh, we got together with Network Rail, with Deutsche Bahn, who provided the instrumentation, uh, and Hitachi, who kindly loaned the train. And we ran a test train through Steventon on electric for the first time. And it, the way we ran these tests was a, a series of increasing speeds with a go no go between each one. Um, we we had it we had pre we had, we had routine MATLAB routines set up so that um, immediately we got through the bridge they'd stop running the instrumentation um, they'd give us the the data straight off the, the laptop we'd run the routines and by the time the train came to a stand we'd already emailed a summary of the results with. Uh, mean contact force minimum contact force maximum contact force all of that data that that we need that would be emailed out to the whole team everybody on the train everybody back at, at ground control uh, before we'd even come to a stand so we could make an instant decision then about are we still feeling good about this are we in a safe space um, so we we did the 85 mile an hour runs and interestingly we were completely compliant at 85 so what that showed is at that time our model was a bit conservative which is not a bad place to be. Since then, we fed those results back into the model. So now our model gets less conservative and more accurate, the more data we feed it. But at that time, it's a bit conservative. So we went up to 100 and that looked okay. We then went to 110 and 110, we were beginning to see some non-compliance, um, but not sufficient for us to be worried about. We then, we stopped and we had a, about a 20 minute chat it was quite, you know, there were some people saying, yeah, let's do the test. Other people naturally cautious, but we wanted to get data all the way to 125 because if, you, if you're deciding on a speed, you want to know where your threshold is and you want to go a little bit beyond it if, if you can. So eventually we decided, yes, we are going to 125 and we managed to do that and, and we did it um, quite safely and, and without incident. So this is the first place, Wilson, where we're going to attempt to run some video. Um, I don't know whether this is going to work. Are we going for the, am I going to run it off of here and see how we go? Yeah, just to say we have had some technical issues with the videos. We tried to sort it out in advance and it didn't, hasn't seemed to work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
So, um, well, I'll talk through what I'm hoping you're about to see, and then we'll see we'll see whether it runs at all or whether it's a, whether it's a, a washout. In which case, we'll move on. So, this is the pantograph footage from that run. So, this is the 125 mile an hour run. Uh, um, the uh, it's a fairly windy day. The rain was holding off at this point, so it was a fair test. We're running from west to east, so we're going to run through the level crossings and then into the steep gradient. And we, you're going to see the pantographs move rapidly downward through that one in 202 gradient. Um, so we've got two pantographs. We've got the rear pantograph on the left, the front pantograph on the right. Below that, you'll see some contacts, some traces. The one to look for is the dark blue trace. That's the contact force. So that's a measure of how much force is being seen at the pantograph wire interface. And on the left, you'll see the, um, in fact, I'll just, what I'll do, yeah. So I'll just pop you to, I'll just start the video running. Right, so I'll stop it there. I'm hoping you can see that. We looking okay, Wilson? You should see, I have a frozen image now. Yeah, that's all good, Gary. Okay, great. So the dark blue trace is the contact force and the scale you want to look at is the zero to 300 on the left. Zero newtons means we start to lose contact, bouncy bouncy along the wire, that's not good for obvious reasons. And 300 newtons is probably the point at which we start kind of sucking our teeth and going, mm, that's a bit high. Um, above 400, you start running the risk of damage to the pantograph or the wire. So that's kind of the range of what good looks like. So let's, I'm going to roll VT now and I'm I'm just going to talk. And then when we get to the end of this run, you can tell me uh, whether it was uh, any good or not. So at the moment we are approaching the level crossing. So the wire is going up. So you'll see this is a normal rate of rise and fall. So you can see it's very gentle, just gently going up. This is about one in a thousand gradient. So this is, this is nice and general. This is what normal looks like for an overhead line engineer. So we then reach the first level crossing. We stay high. We're now at six meter wire height, which is as high as we're allowed to go. And now we hit the second level crossing and then we begin to drop. And we drop all the way into the bridge and then out the other side. So let me just stop and check what that looked like. Wilson, how did it look for you? How choppy was it? It was a little choppy, but I don't think for this, where you've got the graph, yeah. it doesn't matter too much if it's Still smooth because you're, yeah, you're looking yeah. at the data along the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to do that because I tend to look at the panograph rather than the data. So I'm just going to run it again. And this time I'll talk, I'll show you the height. I'll show you the most extreme point in the contact force, which is just coming up. It's just at the top of the, just before we hit the, uh, the steep drop. And I'll just point it, I'll stop it when we get there and I'll point it out to you. So again, coming through the level, going up to the level crossing. Going through. And I think it's just about. You know, this is performance is so good that I've actually forgotten where it actually is on the graph. I think it might be earlier, but it's 316 newtons was the highest that we saw anywhere on this trace. Um, which, given that we're doing three times the rate of rise and fall that the rules would suggest is compliant, um, was quite a result. Right, so let's go back to the. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let's go back to the slides. So, so yeah, peak force 316 newtons. Um, now that's high enough that you wouldn't want to see that every hour of every day, but it wasn't high enough to give us any concerns on a on a single test run. So as a result of that, electric trains now routinely run through, uh, routinely run through, routinely run through. Um, Steventon, we settled on a, a speed of, a, of 110 miles an hour for electric trains, which was, you know, obviously pulling back from that that high contact force of 316. But 110 miles an hour, there's negligible impact on on timetable, which is crucial. I think Wilson, given looking at the timings, we're 
probably running a little behind so i'm going to suggest skipping over the next video actually we could maybe That's... run it at the end over the questions <laughs> yeah why not yeah. let's just say with your timetable worries it was a real concern when we were told that if they have to be electric you have to go at 65 mile an hour mm. not only because of ietes but also because we now have an EMU stabling point at Swindon, at Swindon. where we're now yes. sending the three eight sevens. So yeah, your three eight sevens. That that the, you're right. The eight hundreds can at least switch to diesel and and sort of maintain a sort of reasonable speed. But with the three eight sevens, they'd have to slow down to sixty, and anything behind it would have to. Slow yeah, down. it was effectively putting another freight train in the timetable. Wow. Yeah, and that that bottle that did cut to Swindon is the did cut to Wooten Bassett is the bottleneck on Great Western at the moment, isn't it? Because it's yes. a two-track section. You've, you've got long loops, but as soon as you stack the loops up, yeah. you've had it. Very yeah. much there was a case where it was basically a freight train would enter a loop, sit for 55 minutes, and then go out again. So you try yeah. and stack more than two up, it doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. So Steamton raised an obvious wider question. If the current gradient rules are cons this conservative at Steamton, how conservative are they? everywhere else, uh, particularly for new electrification. Um, so that's what Network Rail has now asked Atkins to help them with. Um, and this is part of their portfolio of cost reduction projects that they have. Um, so since Stevenson, what we've done is we've spun the DRSS tool off to a brand new company, T-RIS. Uh, so T-RIS is run by, uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Nikos Bypass, who uh, is the DRSS guru. He so he's he's created his own company, uh, and we work in partnership with with Nikos uh, to to look at these problems and to help uh, to work out where you know how to solve them. So what we're doing is T-RIS are really focused on the development of the tool now in a way that Atkins probably couldn't have done because it's 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 a fairly niche uh, niche product. Uh, but we work with T-RIS because we provide that real world kind of grounding uh, for them. So what we're doing now is we are we have a project with Network Rail to uh, determine what the national rules should be for gradients for overhead line. So we're 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 taking a, a model test model approach. So phase one is to model um, a range of OLE gradients with a range of pantograph spacings, pantograph types, and speeds, and see where we think the threshold might lie. Um, when we've done phase one, we will then use the findings of phase one to construct a test section of OLE at the old Dolby test track up in the up in the East Midlands. And we'll then do some physical testing in much the same way as we did at Steventon. Uh, and then we'll then again, it's, it's you know, the, the purpose of all this is very much iterative. So we then take the findings of that data, throw it back into the model, refine the model. But the thing is, we can only test one OLE configuration. Uh, old Dolby and realistically we can probably only test one kind of train so you then have to take that data throw it back into the model see what it's telling you about the modeling assumptions refine the model and then at the end of that we then get to recommend a new set of rules for for the UK uh, design industry which is really exciting so that's where we are now we've we are in the middle of phase one we're going to conclude phase one at the end of March we have got the um, testing booked in for the summer and then by the end of this year we should be in a position to be recommending new rules for contact wire gradients. So just to conclude the DRSS piece, um, DRSS is a revolutionary tool. Um, it has the real possibility to remove significant capital cost and program time from major programs at work. We've seen that at Steventon. Steventon Bridge Rebuild would have been conservatively five million pounds. Uh, so that's five million pounds we didn't have to spend. Um, so it's got options, it's got the things you can do with new electrification, but it's also got possibilities for existing systems that are already out there on the network in terms of extending the capability of those systems beyond where we where we currently believe their limitations to be. Um, previously, our designers, when on new electrification, would, if they couldn't meet the rules, would start talking to the civils team about a bridge reconstruction or a track lower. Um, now, we we wouldn't do that. We would the first thing we would say is, well, can we model it? 
maybe we should model it first. Much better to spend a few thousand pounds modeling it than spend five million pounds on a bridge reconstruction. And we do have projects right now that I can't talk about where we've got scenarios similar to Steventon and where we will be doing a modeling approach before we contemplate anything as, um, as significant as a bridge recon or a tra track lower. So the rules are like a safe haven. We, we're not going, we're not going to use DRSS automatically. We'll use it where we can meet the rules. Right, let's, I'm going to move on from DRSS now and talk about the, the second thing that we're working on at the moment, which has got real significant promise. Um, and it's, it's, it's again, it is around the area of bridge reconstructions and track lowers. One of the biggest costs on electrification is those route clearance costs, those bridge recons, track lowers. Um, it, typic, it can account for around one third of the total cost of electrification. So it's a very, very large sums of money we're talking about. Um, now, some of you might be aware, familiar with the, the Cardiff intersection bridge work that car was carried out there by, by Network Rail and the voltage control clearances um, that have been applied there to allow much smaller electrical clearances. I'm not going to talk about that here today because plenty of, uh, plenty of my learned colleagues have already given talks on that. But what's not as well known is that there's a lot more at Cardiff than just the VCC measures. Um, we've got substandard wire heights and we've got a range of other measures that are in place at Cardiff. Um, one of them is, um, is related to uplift. So uplift is um, one of the things we have to allow for in OLE design. You see some, you see some bridge arms here in the, in the photo and they're, they're elastic. They are, they're, they're made of glass fiber. And they're designed to give when the pantograph passes through, but not give too much. And the amount of give, the amount of vertical movement that we see at a bridge arm is called uplift. Now, the standard rule for uplift, the rules that designers like me have to use at the moment, is to allow for 70 millimetres. And that rule has been in place since these were invented and brought into the railway in the 1970s. Um, and this rule is applied regardless of speed, regardless of OLE type regardless of panograph type or any other variable, always 70 millimeters. And this is despite the fact that we know as engineers, we know that there's a relationship between um, uplift force and speed. Um, so despite knowing that there is some kind of relationship between those two things, we still apply a blanket value. So at Cardiff, we didn't have the luxury of doing that. So we actually we used the RSS to model what the uplift would be at Cardiff. Cardiff is only a 40 mile an hour bridge. Um, so we modeled it and what we found is that we only needed, we, we, we were predicting only 26 millimeters of uplift at Cardiff. And that was the value that was used in, as part of developing the design for that. I think we'll try our second video here and we'll see how it goes. I'm just going to show you what uplift actually looks like. This is a fairly brief video. Um, so let me just explain what I hope you're looking at here. And Wilson will tell me if for any reason you're not looking at it. Um, this is a typical registration location on Great Western. And this is a, a registration arm which is, is free to move up and down under the action of a pantograph. So as the pantograph goes through, you will see the wire lift and then fall again. And you can see that it moves. You can see it's mo not moving a lot. It's not a huge amount, but it, it's an amount and you have to allow for it because clearly it brings the live parts closer to the bridge than they would otherwise be. I'd say that it was still fairly stuttery, but if, any, if anything, that helped highlight it more because the different mm -hmm. frames showed the different yeah. heights. Yeah, the, yeah. And if I roll it back wire. to, yeah, so if I roll it back to this frame, where you can see it. And then if I do this, you can see it drop. So we have to make allowance for that movement because it brings the live equipment closer to the bridge and because we have to maintain a minimum air gap between those live parts and the bridge. So we, we, know, that, we know that we have to allow for it, but we also know that 70 millimeters isn't actually the answer everywhere. Um, so, so what do we what are we doing about that then? Well, we can't. The first thing to say is we could sit and model every bridge with DRSS. We could do that, 
it wouldn't be cost effective and it wouldn't be time effective we could do it but it, it we're not going to do it it's not actually what you want to do if you know that a rule is too conservative you need to find a way of changing the rule you don't keep operating to the rule and say well let's model it instead you need to change the rules but in order to change the rules again you need evidence you need data and in this case we need actual uplift measurements so network rail approached us at the end of 2019 approached us and said look could you find a way of measuring uplift out on the network real uplifts and we we want you to we don't want you to measure it once or even five times we need it to be statistically meaningful so we need measurements a, a, a range of locations on a range of systems and a range of speeds. So they asked us to undertake a project to do that. Um, now, to our knowledge, this has never been done before. Um, measuring the problem with measuring anything on, on an overhead line is that putting measurement sensors into 25,000 volts is um, is difficult because it's a terrible electromagnetic environment to put. You know, most sensors measure in millivolts and you're going to put it in an environment where it's at 25,000 volts plus or minus 20 percent with loads of harmonics and all sorts of horrible things going on. Um, so electri electrical sensors really, you can't, you, it just doesn't work. Um, so traditionally, the way to measure uplift was to put a pneumatic sensor onto the bridge arm. And the problem with that is it's hard to fit at one location, never mind multiple. But also it actually affects the measurement. Putting a piston into the into the thing you want to measure influences the measurement. But Atkins has been doing a lot of work or had been doing a lot of work with a, a new technique called digital image correlation, DIC. So digital image correlation is basically where you use photogrammetry. You take a series of 2D images using video cameras and then you reconstruct a 3D model from the 2D image, you 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 recreate you you create a plane within the image, and then you determine what movements are taking place, and crucially, what how big those movements are. Um, you do need to have one image, one object in the image that you know the size of to give you that frame of reference. So, but when Network Rail approached us, we'd only been using DIC to measure bridge deflections, and we've been doing that very successfully. So some of you will be familiar with the work um, taking place at Bletchley to remove the flyover. Uh, well, we we uh, did a lot of work to measure the bridge deflections as that bridge was being demolished to make sure that it wasn't unduly flexing. Um, so we'd used it for that, but we'd never used it for this. We'd never used it to look at overhead line. But our, our DIC team, they, we, 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 we told them what the problem was and they were, they were convinced that they could do it. But um, obviously we couldn't just, we needed more than just, you know, a gut feeling that we could do it. So what we did is we, we, we were a bit naughty. Um, the OLE team, we, we threw the DIC team a piece of video, very similar to the video that you just saw actually. We gave them a piece of video that wasn't shot with that purpose in mind wasn't really in the plane that they would like it in. It was just a piece of video that we had. Um, and we gave them one fixed dimension in the image. We told them how big the how big the registration arm was. And then we just let them get on with it. We didn't tell them what uplift it looked like. We didn't tell them what appropriate values were. We just, we, we, we did a, a proper old fashioned uh, blind trial, if you like, in scientific terms. And they, two days later, they came back with the trace that you see on the right. This is the very first trace that we got out of them. And if you're an overhead line engineer, you, you'll instantly recognize this as a very, very plausible trace. We see the wire oscillating as before the pan arrives. We see the first pan hit. We see a, a, an uplift of peak uplift of 45 millimeters. And then we see the oscillations continue. And then we see the second panograph pass through with a smaller displacement. And as soon as we saw this result, we said, great we're in we can do this this you know this is going to work so we committed to network rail to undertake the work um what network rail wanted was three days of monitoring at uh, up to 10 sites so 15 days uh, sorry 30 days uh, in in all of monitoring um so we started to plan for the sites uh we what we found was that actually planning Finding the right sites is the hardest bit of the job, actually, much harder than doing the measurements. Uh, doing the measurements is, is fairly 
straightforward as long as you've got some light and as long as you've got a good line of sight but actually finding sites that where you've got all of the things you need was quite tricky but we started planning it in March of last year unfortunately something else happened in March of last year and I'm not going to dwell on what that was you all know what it was you're all living through it just like uh, just like we are um, unfortunately what it meant was we were planning to send people to various parts of the UK uh, to stay in hotels and do surveys um, during a pandemic. So that has put quite a bit of constraint on what we've been able to do um, uh, over the over the period. But we worked out a mitigation plan. And once the lockdown began to ease in May, we were able to commence some surveys with some additional controls uh, to make sure that we were keeping our people safe. So here's the first site that we visited. Um, this is uh, St Mary's Road, which is between Langley and Slough on the Great Western Main Line. So we did a trial day there and it went really well. We, we, we could see that it, we were getting plausible results. So we proceeded with the plan. Um, and over the course of between May and December last year, we managed to get to five sites and do 15 days worth of measurement in all. Um, so I'll just explain what you see here. This is a tip, fairly typical setup. What we have is four, um, they're specialist cameras. They're not the sort of thing that you would buy uh, if, if you go to Jessup's, they are specialist cameras, but they're very portable, very small, and they sit on ordinary tripods uh, and they sit line side, which is great. So there's no track access needed. We don't need to um, take a block or anything like that. We sim All we need is line of sight to the bridge arm, which you can see here. So as long as we can see the bridge arm and we can point the camera at it, we're good. We have two cameras per track. Uh, the second camera is there to measure another fixed point so that we can accurately measure the speed of the train uh, as it goes through. Um, so here what we're doing is monitoring two tracks simultaneously. We can monitor, we've got enough equipment to monitor two tracks at the same time. And all those cameras feed into a ruggedized computer, uh, which is actually recording the video but also uh, it's doing more than just recording video. It's, it allows the engineers to check that we've actually getting good data and that we are, that we can see uplift and, and, and check the, the results as they come in. We've also got a weather station. So we're recording weather data continuously as well because weather can have a big impact on, on forces on overhead line. For instance, if you've got headwind, that will make a big difference to the pantograph uh, aerodynamic behavior. So, Unfortunately, we were going gangbusters and it was all going very well. And we all went home for Christmas, planning to go to Scotland and do two more sites in January. And you all know what happened over Christmas. So I'm not going to dwell on that either. Suffice to say that we did a risk assessment in the first week of January and very rapidly concluded that none of our staff were going to be going anywhere for a while and it wouldn't be safe or wise to do so. Um, so what we did then, we sat down with Network Rail and we kind of replanned our delivery of this. So what we're going to do now is we've got, the good news is we've got a lot of data already. So we are going to use that data to come up with some initial recommendations and we're going to submit those recommendations to Network Rail at the end of March. Uh, and then we are going to, I'm hopeful that Network Rail will then take those recommendations and run with them and I fully expect them to do that and then when we're able to we will go and visit some more sites to refine our data and hopefully refine those results even more and possibly take even more savings. So interestingly and excitingly and I haven't I haven't mentioned this to you Wilson but um, you're the first people to see these results you're the first people I got clearance from Network Rail this morning uh, to share some of our initial findings with you. Um, we do so like we, a good exclusive here. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We all love a good exclusive. So this is a summary plot of the uh, the trains that we measured so far. Just to give you an idea of the volume of data we've got, we measured 733 trains. 733 uh, trains, but we've got more than that. We've actually got 1183 pantograph measurements because some trains have more than one pantograph. So we've got over a thousand data points, which is you know the biggest nobody's nobody's ever gathered data on this scale interestingly we it's funny that even though we've got that data my my chief analyst is still still saying gary i want more data 
Um, the, the, there's a, there are a few hard rules in life, but one, one, one hard rule is that if you ask a scientist, they'll always want more data. Um, but we have got a lot of data and we've certainly got enough data to start drawing some conclusions. Interestingly, what you see here, if you look at the, the y-axis, which is where, you know, I'm sure everybody likes to look on these graphs, you'll notice that we're not at 70 millimeters here. The highest uh, uplift we've seen anywhere on the network is 45.2 millimeters. And even allowing for, you know, some measurement accuracy, which obviously all systems have, all measurement systems have a measurement tolerance, even allowing for, we think ours is around about the one millimeter mark. We think we're accurate to about a millimeter. So even allowing for that, we're nowhere near uh, the current allowance that we make. So what I'm not going to do on, on today's presentation is tell you what our recommendations are going to be, because frankly, we're still writing them. Uh, but we do expect that we'll be bringing that number down significantly from 70 millimetres. To give you an idea, um, uh, a Cardiff intersection bridge, every millimetre was worth a million pounds in terms of, in terms of reduction of bridge intervention. So, um, you know, if we can bring that and I'm not going to say what we're going to bring it down by, but if we can bring it down, uh, you know, 10 millimetres, that's 10 million pounds. 20 millimetres, 20 million pounds. You get the idea. Um, so we're going, we're going to be making a recommendation for a significant reduction, uh, and we will be. Uh, I expect that we'll be taking that saving forward in future electrification schemes. And there are, uh, contrary to popular belief, there are electrification schemes being developed as we speak, and I expect those schemes to be taking that saving because we'll be going and seeing those schemes and telling them, are you aware of this work? Do you know about these savings? They're there to be had. Right, we definitely run over, so I'm going to wrap this up now. Uh, what have we seen? And draw some conclusions from all this. Um, we've seen that electrification has turned the corner in terms of cost effectiveness. Recent schemes have demonstrated the most recent one, key output one on middle and main line. Bedford, Kettering, Corby is delivering on time and on budget, for instance. Um, so we've seen that we can do it, we can do it at a fair price. Um, we've also seen that a rolling program brings down costs, and I really can't stress that enough. Doing things at a regular pace and regularly and at scale brings down the cost of things that is a basic rule of economics and it's equally it's just as uh, true in electrification as it is everywhere else but we've seen that the traditional rules-based process is adding cost it is adding cost to the way to what we do so using some of the new techniques that we have whether it's simulation or measurement uh, has the definite possibility of reducing those costs Obviously, what we can't answer is whether or not government is going to accept NOAA Rail's recommendation of a rolling programme. Uh, I'm probably more hopeful than most people are at the moment. I think it's, it is true that, they, that, that that case hasn't been fully made yet, but um, I expect that industry is going to come out fighting on that one, and then we're going to see more on that front uh, in the near future. And when we do get a rolling programme, we've got these new range of techniques and we will be deploying them at scale to reduce costs. Okay, and that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening. Sorry for going a bit longer than I thought I would have done. Uh, and I'll hand over to Q&A. Thanks very much, Gary. I wouldn't worry about running over a little bit. There's always better to get it all out than rush through things. Um, do a few questions, if that's all right, mm -hmm. unless you're yeah, in a rush to disappear. I've got nowhere to go, um, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's as, dinner time. As always. So, no plans um, tonight. <laughs> um, if you haven't submitted a question already, there is a function in the chat to submit questions, which I can see, and then I will ask Gary. Um, the one I'm quite interested in is from Juliana, is asking, do, do NR ever construct studies to determine whether a level crossing can just be closed without a replacement bridge in order to save costs and Yes, time? they do. Um, well, it's interesting because, that, 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 I mean, let's just, Let's just, we're not talking about electrification. Let's just talk about level crossing closure as, a, as an end in itself. Um, Network Rail has a rolling program of level crossing closures. Uh, Network Rail, the industry has recognized that level crossings are, I think they are actually the number one safety risk now. 
I think that's right. If it's not number one, it's number two. And I can't remember what number one is. Um, uh, clearly, any interface where, where we, we all know how road vehicle users can behave. Um, they are an unruly bunch at the best of times. So any anywhere where you bring road vehicles into onto the railway, uh, you run you're running risk. So Network Rail uh, would like to close. I'm sure if if you ask uh, if you ask the head of Network Rail now, they'd like to close all their level crossings. Uh, unfortunately, um, doing that is a lengthy process, is a difficult process. Often you do need to provide an alternative route because. You know, there, there are reasons why a lot of these crossings exist. But have we closed level crossings without providing an alternative route? Yes, we have done that in the past. Um, sometimes we'll close the road, but provide a footbridge. Um, and we'll say, you know, that there's alternative road routes already available, but we do need to provide a foot access. It, it depends on it depends on the circumstances. Some level crossings are barely used at all. Uh, I know a footpath near me. Uh, which I've visited several times, and I've never seen another person use it. Uh, on the other hand, there are foot crossings that there's another foot crossing near me just down the road, um, which is used by about one dog walker every 10 minutes. It depends on usage. It depends on usage. Um, in terms of electrification, yes, we have closed crossings as part of electrification as well. But it's gone from it's... having. Sorry, Gary. No, no, carry on, Watson. <laughs> As I was saying, we've gone from having a few questions to a, a pile of questions. So uh, it's away. If, it's good. we call it sort of 10, 15 minutes of questions. Does that sound good to you? Absolutely fine by me. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, what ones have we got? There's one. There's a couple of here asking about has there been checks on where um, to pantograph? And I'm guessing the wire itself. Yeah. Uh, no, that's, that's a really good question. The answer is yes. So. When 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 Network Rail and GWR kind of jointly decided that the 110 miles an hour is the answer, we weren't. What we're not saying at Steventon is that everything's going to be brilliant at Steventon forever. Um, we Network Rail fully expects that the the price it's going to pay for breaking the gradient rule is increased wear on the wire. Absolutely, over time that that frictional heating. Uh, what what tends to happen is the pantograph has a pneumatic system and the pneumatic system can't react quickly enough so you you can expect to see a spike in contact force as you hit that that down slope um, and that should trans that will probably translate into increased wear so network rail has a um, has a special maintenance regime on that section of wire so I think every six months for a period of at least two years it's going to go in and measure wear and see what's happening in reality um, so yeah, we're not we're not saying it's going to be great, but you know what? Uh, if you're a track engineer, there are places where you know you're going to have in, increased intervention on maintenance. Why shouldn't it be any difference different on the electrification? If we want to electrify routes at cost effectively, this is probably the sort of thing that we have to be accepting at some loca. Not wouldn't want to be accepting it at lots of locations, but it, it, the odd location, um, there is no reason why we shouldn't. Uh, accept that as long as it's in a controlled way. Yeah, as you say, it's like different junction layouts, like throats to ma major London termini, Waterloo is going to have massive wear on certain sets yeah, of points. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if if we had a, an, an overhead line route asset manager in the audience of this, he would be coming on now to start swearing at me and saying, How dare you say that, Gary? I don't want, you know, I have a hard enough job as it is with my three <laughs> members of staff and, and hundreds of miles to cover. But um, but no, um, it, it, it needs to be done in a careful, targeted way, and it needs to be done not too often. This is the sort of thing, if you've got one of these on a route, that's fine. If you've got 20 of them on a route, then you've got a problem. You, you mm. wouldn't do this everywhere. And, and frankly, you don't need to do this everywhere because how often do you have a level crossing right next to a bridge? Um, <laughs> I'm looking at, at the moment, we're doing some work looking at another significant route in the UK, uh, which is about 200 miles long. And we've got one of the, we've got one serious, Steventon style location and one that's on the edge of being Steventon-ish. So um, two out of you know 200 miles is is about is about the rate of these that you're going to find typically. Uh, question from Jack here. Um, 
When updating standards for modern OLE designs, to what extent can we learn from other countries and other systems such as Germany, which have had substantial modern electrification programs? Yeah. The thing about other countries is a lot of their a lot of their work doesn't translate across because if you look at the German network, um, they'll tend to be much more that they they'll every country adopts the first thing is every country adopts a different balance of risk and cost um and and generally and i think it's because of the intense or it was because of the intense use of the network prior prior to the pandemic and i suspect that within five years we'll be going well that was a blip wasn't it you know the the route i expect the network will return to being intensively used the only discussion is really over what time scale but um a lot of the time they simply don't have the situations that we have um they also use there's, there's so many variables in an oe system it's absolutely crazy you know if you ask yourself how many railways run three pans up so if you look at a 12 car emu you're talking about three pantographs at 80 meter spacings. Um, there are very few railways around the world that run those kind of trains at 110 miles an hour. Generally on the net, on, on the continent, they're, they're much, as you know, Wilson, they're much bigger fans of loco haul trains yeah. uh, than we are. Um, so they, they look at us and go, why have you got three pantographs up? Why are you going that fast with three pantographs up? You know, it's just a crazy thing to do. So you can't, you can't always read across those. That's not to say we can never learn lessons from other countries. Clearly we can, but on this particular issue, they just don't run trains in this way. They wouldn't, and they'd also, uh, frankly, be more aggressive at closing their level crossings. Um, their, their, their legal, the legal framework for closing a level crossing in the UK is so complicated that most lawyers don't even understand the legislation around level crossings because you've got layers of bills upon bills upon acts of parliament uh, layered up and the legal many level crossings don't have a definitive legal so i know it sounds crazy but there are lots of level crossings that don't have a definitive legal position and the only way to find out what the legal position is is to attempt to close them which is <laughs> um, a strange like situation poke the bear with a stick and see what's yeah, going to happen exactly do not poke the bear we literally have level crossings on the uk that we call them sleeping dogs and the reason they're called sleeping dogs is nobody's sure if they're really open or closed nobody's sure if anybody's using them and nobody's sure whether or not they're legally supposed to be there or not uh, so we call them sleeping dogs because the thing about a sleeping dog is you never want to wake it up no. um, yeah so level level crossings are a bit of a bit of a nightmare no and i'd say we're going back to the continent yeah i think it must just be a british thing because i can't think of many maybe japan is probably the only major country i can think in the world where most of their trains are units and multiple mm. unit things for long yeah. distance of course in japan they've segregated all of their high speed their, their inner city traffic is essentially running on a on a different well, railway to the a different gauge isn't it speed and a different gauge as well yeah exactly um so here's one i'm interested i can think of a potential location of baths for this baths bar but um other than steventon and royal and the royal border bridge berwick where else in the uk has ju uh his specific ohle been installed in a bespoke manner for sort of heritage or other reasons there are there are lots yeah there are lots there are more places than you'd think um and i'm I, obviously i don't have it top top of my head i'm not gonna have an exhaustive list so but, bath is the um, one that comes to mind as a potential one because i know when it depends what you mean by bespoke i think when a lot of people talk about bespoke OLE, they mean visually appealing OLE, mm -hmm. um which is a which is a different problem to the steventon problem if you if you're talking about something that has bespoke dynamics um, I can think of places like um, the Thameslink Tunnel, where we are significantly lower wires than is, is permissible by standards. For instance, we have wires, and the same at Cardiff Intersection Bridge, the wire height at Cardiff is below the minimum that's permitted in the group standard. Um, so we do have places like that where we've adopted specific um, dynamic um, arrangements. In terms of aesthetics, um, it's you're right you're probably right i think royal border bridge is probably the only place there may be one or two other places where we've put in tubular masts um 
to wasn't there an issue around Goring Gap? Goring Gap? There was an issue around Goring Gap where, um, and I'm going to choose my words with care here, where <laughs> Network Rail did not. And no, I can say this because it's it's in the public domain that that Network Rail had a statutory obligation to consult um, with uh, with the appropriate bodies in the uh, in the AONB through Goring, um, and uh, didn't do so at the right time. They did do it, but they didn't do it early enough, and that caused a lot of angst. Um, but it's interesting that that angst has now melted away. Um, the, the residents of Goring now enjoy an excellent electric train service every 15 we're minutes. We're not taking them out. <laughs> um, and we're not taking the, the standard series one structures out. Um, and I've not heard anybody complaining about that recently. Mm. Um, funny thing, change is a funny thing for people. Um, if you look at, if you look at, um, people don't like new things coming in, but once they're there, they tend to get used to them and very quickly become quite attached to them. And then if you propose removing it, they get annoyed about that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, the, what I think the lesson of Goring is you have to take people with you. And if you don't mm. do that, and if you don't do it early, and if you don't listen to people early on, then you're going to run into trouble. So I fully expect that if electrification rolls forward, we're going to have to listen to people. That doesn't mean that we're going to start putting finials on top of masts and designing, you know, curlicues and, and other architectural features on OLE structures, but we do need to listen to people. You know, electrification is a big intrusion into into people, especially if you live alongside that railway. So we do need to listen to people. Shall we go for one more? What have we got? Because it is nearly quarter past seven. Um, there's so many to choose from, I don't know. <laughs> there's no real duplicates either. They're all individual wow. ones. Um, Here's a good one from Scott, because um, I think I've seen you post on Twitter about certain things like this. So, mm. um, through the changes you've made and your efforts in changing electrification, have you seen this implemented elsewhere to other than what you've worked on in the UK or across the world? And have other people across um, in approached you to say, that's good, can we learn from you? Um, we certainly had people approach us um... So another piece of work that we're doing um, that w was a, as a direct result at Steventon is that we are, I haven't even mentioned this, but we're using DRSS to model some of the overhead line arrangements that are going to be on Cardiff Valleys. Cardiff Valleys is, an, is going to be a novel arrangement. Um, they're going to be running uh, lots of permanent earth sections through bridges which means they're placing neutral sections on approach to bridges, which is an unusual thing to do. Um, normally we, we put neutral sections as far away from bridges as we can. Um, so uh, we were approached by the pro that project to do some modeling on that. So we've completed that work. And we've, we looked at um, a range of different uh, configurations to work out what the contact forces would look like for each one. So we've already used it for that. Um, uh, Beyond that, we are so we are using the findings of Steventon in our own projects. And again, I, I I I can't say too much about some of these projects because they're still in the development phase. But um, I fully expect that a um, a modelling approach to gradients will become a standard part of the project toolkit for UK projects. And I fully expect that once we have a chat, we have, once we've codified our recommendations, that um, that saving and uplift, I suspect, will make its way into projects quite quickly, um, possibly in advance of the, it appearing formally in standards. Because, you know, if you think about the way that Network Rail develops its projects, it goes through a development process. And, you know, we've got projects now that are in effectively GRIP 2 or GRIP 3 that are 18 months to two years away from construction. Um, so why wouldn't you take that now? If you know that a standard is going to be changed, you don't actually have to wait for it to change uh, in order to take that saving. Obviously, that doesn't mean you just run off and, and do what you like. But if you talk to the people who are going to change the standard and you get some comfort from them of this is where we're going with this, then you can start to build that saving into your projects. 
you have to do that because the alternative is that you you we have a sort of two to three year lag before we start getting any of these savings into into projects and we clearly can't afford to do that so yeah so it is already happening and we Atkins are involved in lots of we're involved with most of the network rail routes in terms of so we're we we're working in Scotland for instance we're working on some of the electrification schemes there and I I look forward to doing this presentation to the to my Scottish colleagues uh, as soon as I can get hold of them really to to tell them what we're what our findings are and and, and um, see if they've got any similar problems. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Is there any way people can yeah, contact you if they want to ask you more? If you're happy for that, I imagine yeah, I'll you... certainly. I'll 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 um I'll pass through my contact details to you, Wilson, and um feel free to to forward those on to the attendees. Same. And thank you In to that, everyone okay. for attending. It's uh it's a bit of a strange way to do presentations, this, but uh, I hope uh, I hope the technologies work for you, and uh, hope you find it interesting. I quite enjoy doing online ones because it allows people from across the world, if you really wanted to, I'm mm. sure everyone here is actually from the UK, but I know for a fact that we've had a few international attendees once or twice to come and watch things yeah, like yeah. this. I miss, um, I, miss whereas, I miss the moving around part and the seeing people's eyeballs. I was um, realising when I was replying I'm to you. I'm quite an excitable was... presenter. I like waving my hands and drawing things on the board, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. And so I miss that aspect of it, I must admit. Of course, you can't go and have a nice chat afterwards, nope. <laughs> no. and no free tea and coffee, no, or curly sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your sandwiches aren't curly. Yeah. Um, so if, if anyone has any further questions for Gary, uh, feel free to contact me at wilson.hill at youngrailpro.com. Um, feel free to uh, visit our website at young, uh, you might as well just Google Young Rail Professionals, and it'll be the first result that comes up. It's easier than trying to explain a, a web address to you. And as always, on the Western region, we're always looking out for people to get involved in our committee. So if you do wish to get involved, please contact me and uh, we will see what we can do. I hope you all have a good evening. Thanks again very much, Gary, for coming along. And I hope Thank to you. see you all again soon.